A little better? You hear me? All right. Well, I was uh, raised in the Roman Catholic Church and pretty much stood there or sat there or knelt there or did everything, and it was all very stoic. Then I got saved. Went to churches where people are doing crazy things, like, you know, raising your hands. Why do we raise our hands? A couple things. This is surrender. And surrender to Jesus is a wonderful thing. This, it's a, a wave offering of our praise for thank you. You know, when I watch baseball with Matthew or even alone and something dramatic happens, I, I always go like that. How much better is what Jesus has done for us? Yeah. Worthy? All right. Father God, we thank you for the praise that begins in your heart. It's placed in ours, and we give it back to you. We love you. We need you. We thank you for your word, the instruction and in righteousness that you give to us. And so we ask that you'd give us the gift of teaching, that we would, in fact, understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have a Bible, first of all, go to Ephesians chapter 1, but then also we're going to start at some point, in Revelation chapter 2. So a couple of bookmarks. But uh, as we proceed now on our chronological study of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, last week we concluded the book of Acts. Uh, we saw Paul's divine appointment in Malta. Why the, why the storm? Why the shipwreck? God had work to do on Malta. And he shipwrecked his servant toward that end. But then we saw his right on time arrival after seven months of journey uh, into Rome. And there in Rome, the last couple of verses in Acts chapter 28 say that he, he dwelt there for two years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence no man forbidding him. So he's there under house arrest in an Airbnb in Rome waiting to see Nero. And during those two years, he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what we call prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And we're going to start Philemon, or excuse me, uh, Ephesians this morning. And to put it in a chronological context, backing up a bit in time, uh, on his second missionary journey, which is chronicled for us in Acts chapter 16 through 18, Paul ministered to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. He was in Thessalonica for three weeks. He was in Corinth for 18 months. And while he was in Corinth, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write two letters to the Thessalonians. In the first letter, there was a revelation of a mystery of God, the rapture. And in the second letter, uh, he spoke a lot about the things before the day of the Lord. Leaving Corinth, going back to Antioch, concluding the second missionary journey, he stops in Ephesus very briefly. He reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue, and they wanted him to stay longer, but he had things to do, if you will, and he said, I'll come back. So... When his third missionary journey started, and this is in Acts chapter 19, his first stop was Ephesus. And there he spent three years declaring unto them the entire counsel of God, which of course is all that we call the Hebrew scriptures. But also by that time, given the, chron the chronology of his ministry, it would include the things that were revealed to him and recorded by him in 1 Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. And so it's with that doctrinal briefcase, Paul taught the Ephesians. They were very well fed. And doctrine matters. And they were doctrinally enriched. So now, Chronologically, Rome is where we are. Paul's under house arrest. He's inspired to write this letter. And this letter is rich. It is rich in doctrine. 
The first three chapters uh, focused on what God has done for us. And then chapters four, five, and six really is how we are to respond to what God has done for us. And the purpose of the letter, the overarching purpose of the letter, is instruction in righteousness in a mystery of God, which is the church. Uh, And our journey with him. A couple ways to look at it. The first three chapters in Ephesians is how we, we are to sit with Christ. Chapters four and five, we walk with Christ. And in chapter six, we stand in Christ as individual believers, as well as members of a body, this church, which is referred to as a body. It's referred to as a temple. It's referred to as a bride, and it's referred to as a soldier in this letter. And so it's important that we know who we are if we're to be who we are. And this is a very rich epistle. But in Revelation chapter 3, moving forward in time, about 30 years from where we are in Rome with Paul, they're going to get another letter. The church at Ephesus is going to get another letter. But this one's dictated by Jesus himself. And it reads, starting in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 2, Unto the angel of the church of, of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God." In 30 years, after receiving this letter from Paul, they receive a letter from Jesus. And they are strong in doctrine and in ministry. But they become weak in their relationship with Jesus. The ministry has supplanted Jesus as the most important thing in their Christian life. And that's backwards. And Jesus calls them on it and tells them to repent because Jesus cares more about the minister than he does the ministry. So understanding where this body of people is, and as we develop that in the letter to the Ephesians, we also bear in mind where they're going. And we need to hear what the Spirit is saying to us also. So with that, Ephesians chapter 1. The first two sentences, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. And there's a whole lot there, and we need to unpack it. Obviously, it's a letter, so every the first part of a letter is a salutation. This, This letter is from Paul, but he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to record these words. These are inspired words of God. Uh, But Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's the 12th apostle. He's Judas's replacement. And he is an apostle by the will of God. Who chose him to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and gave him to Jesus? 
The Father did. It was God's choice. It was not Paul's choice. It was God's choice. And this letter is to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, first of all, what's, what's a saint? A saint is a believer in Jesus Christ that has been separated from sin and separated from the world and separated unto God. The Greek word for saint is hagios. It means sanctified. It means holy ones. It is not an office in the church. It is not an attainment by man as voted on other men. It is a state. It is a condition whereby God in his grace has called someone unto himself. A saint is one who believes the testimony of God that he has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. And he who has the son has life. That's a saint. But this letter is also to the faithful in Christ Jesus. People who have made a choice to believe the testimony of God and to invest the measure of the faith of Christ that they've been given in Christ and to follow him. And in so doing, they have a positional righteousness before God the Father in heaven. Letter to the saints and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Almost synonymous, but are they the same people? Is it two ways of addressing the church at Ephesus? Could be. Could it also be synonymous, but different people? Addressing the church at Ephesus, but also all faithful everywhere. Kind of like you and me. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, saints are faithful, and the faithful are saints. Verse 2 is the greeting. starts with grace, divine favor, which is not deserved. What is deserved? Justice. Peace. Justified by faith. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. A formerly hostile relationship. Me to God. An unregenerate, unsaved person to God is reconciled and it's made right. All hostility toward God is gone forever. An enemy is transformed into a child. This is the same greeting that is a part of all the epistles, grace and peace. The one exception is the letters to Timothy and Titus, pastors. He also tacks on mercy because pastors need a whole lot of mercy. Amen? Amen. Grace and peace in all the epistles, and it's always in that same order because you must first receive the grace of God in order to have peace with God. We have peace with God only because of God's grace. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Blessed means adorable, means worthy of adoration. And truly God is worthy of all adoration. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's being addressed, who is hailed as blessed, the first person in the triune Godhead, referencing the second person in the triune Godhead, which means two things. First of all, there's a personal relationship between the first person and the second person of the Godhead that's revealed in Scripture. And secondly, because of God's grace and the subsequent peace, saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus also have personal relationships with the first person and the second person in the Godhead. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Us. Who's us? Saints. The faithful in Christ. He's blessed us. He's, the Father has spoken well of us. He's invoked a blessing upon us. If that doesn't blow your mind, you know, all of this blows my mind. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all. What's excluded from all? What's included in all? What has the Father withheld from us? Spiritual blessings, non-material gifts from the, the supernatural uh, largesse of God, not from the worldly largesse of the world, as the prosperity gospel would have you to believe. And we have to bear in mind something. He, he is God. We are not. We are saints. We are the faithful in Christ. But we are not God. We will never be God. He is infinite. We are finite. We'll remain finite. But the Father has bestowed all the benefits of God upon us. Where? In heavenly places. Reading the King James. Notice, places is in italics. Heavenly, that word heavenly, means heaven. It's the abode of God. It's where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Greek word is epornanios. It's, an, it's a plural adjective. What does an adjective do? Modifies a noun. And in Greek, as, as in Spanish, so in Greek. A uh, plural adjective modifies a plural noun. That's not, like, that's not that way in English, but it is that way in Spanish. It is that way in uh, Greek also. The noun is missing, or it's implied. But it's in italics, which tells us what? The King James translators put it there. If we go to verse 20 in this chapter which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. In chapter 2, verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 10, to the intent now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Same word. The heavenly places. Sometimes uh, I find myself saying heavenlies. In the heavenlies. Or I've heard other people say it. Or I've even read it. And so I wondered if that was even valid. But in English, because it's, it's not in this English, when we say heavenlies, that's an English noun. Therefore, it's an incorrect translation of a Greek adjective. And I had an interesting rabbit trail about that until I realized that this is not a proper translation. So, oh well, you don't get to hear it. doesn't matter because, well, the, the premise was wrong. We're not in the heavenlies. We're in heavenly places. That is help. In Hebrews chapter 11, helps us to understand that. Hebrews chapter 11. All about faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, starting verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Therefore, what is earth to those who are the faithful in Christ Jesus? 
a strange place, a strange land. Verse 14, for, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And the Greek word underneath country means either fatherland or home. Verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country, italicized, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned, to return to that fatherland, to return to that land. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country, also italicized, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That country, it means home, fatherland, home of the father. What's the home of the father? Heaven, from which, in the right time, from which is going to come a city. Revelation chapter 21 tells us about the eternal city of New Jerusalem that's going to come down to a new earth, an earth that is sin-free, an earth that is curse-free. It's going to come out of heaven from God. It's going to be lighted by the glory of God. That's his home. It's going to be his home. Uh, country means his home. It's a heavenly country. That's the same thing that's going on here in Ephesians chapter 1. Heaven. We're speaking of heaven. Going back to Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's our position before the Father in his home, which is soon to be our home. If you are a saint, if you are a faithful in Christ Jesus, heaven is your home. This Earth is a strange land. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, says the Spirit itself... Now, wait a minute. Let's stop there. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Person is not an it. So, my personal opinion, it, it should say the Spirit himself. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. The Father has given everything to the Son. The Father is at his home. The Son is at his right hand. We are in Christ. That's our position before the Father in his home. And we're joint heirs with Jesus. John 14, verses 1 and 3. Jesus promised us. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and whither I go, ye know, in the way you know. He was returning to heaven. He was returning home. He's preparing a place at home, that we can be at home with him at the point in time when our time here is done. Our home is heaven. Our position at home before the Father is righteousness, acceptability, pleasing, because Jesus is righteous. He's our righteousness. He is pleasing. He is accepted. We're in him. Therefore, before the Father, we are pleasing to him. So what are all the spiritual blessings? What are all the benefits of God? In heaven, and later, in the eternal city of God, what are all the spiritual blessings in Christ with which God has blessed us? <laughs> we're going to have to wait to find out. Because I think it's unspeakable. If, we're, if Paul could have written them down, he probably could have, or would have. But... Human language fails when we're talking about God and all. We just can't describe it. But in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 20, 
he says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, the promise of God of all his spiritual blessings in Christ is far grander than anything we could imagine or even be so bold as to ask. So, if you are a, a saint, if you are among the faithful in Christ Jesus, that promise, those blessings, they belong to you. But do we not, all of us, know people who are not saints, know people who are not among the faithful in Christ Jesus, but we want them to have all those indescribable benefits of God in heaven just like us? Yes, so what do we do? We have good news. We preach the gospel. And we pray that the Father would soften their hearts, that they would be willing to enter into a right personal relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to hear the good news. We have mouths where to speak the good news into people's lives around us because we want them to have these blessings as have been promised to us. Verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, according as these spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, in that, in so much that he, who's he? God the Father has chosen he has selected, he has exercised his sovereign will to make a choice. He has chosen us, believers, saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus, in him. He's chosen us in him. Who's him? In Christ. We, our position before God is in Christ. Before him in Christ, which is the only position of acceptability, pleasing, and righteousness before the Father. When did he choose us? Before the foundation of the world. Before Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Before that, he chose us. In 2 Timothy, also, Jesus is involved in all that. First, because in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Hebrew word is Elohim. El is Hebrew singular. Elohim is God's plural. Whoa! That mystery, the mystery of God, is revealed in time through Scripture. John 1, 3 tells us all things were made by him, the word that was in the beginning with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in addition to that, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, we're told that God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, he's called us into holiness. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ before the world began. In chapter 2 of this book, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, going back to verse 4, that we should be, that we exist, that we would, pronou be, we would be pronounced to be holy, sin-free, pure, and without blame, unblemished, undefiled, unstained, faultless, unblameable. Where? Before him, in front of his face, we are holy and without blame, standing face to face before the holy God, holy and without blame. How's that possible? Because something radical happened. 
Our position before him was before we bent our knee and confessed with our tongue in time that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, our sins separated us. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And where does that leave us? Well, outside of his presence. Because in Psalm 5 verse 4, we're told that thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. We were not holy, we were evil. We were separated from God. We couldn't go home to heaven. We couldn't stand before him holy and without blame. And there wasn't anything we could do about that. What did God do? In love. Face to face, before him, in agape, which is his nature. God is love but it's also his perfect, supernatural, overflowing love, much of which is taught us in 1 John chapter 4 in particular. Verse 8, God is love. That's his nature. Uh, chapter 4, verse 10, and herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, the ransom, the atonement for our sins. Because God so loved the world, the people in the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe, exercise a choice, would believe, would not perish but have everlasting life. And he demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9, 19 rather. We love him because he first loved us. And the verse prior to that, there is no fear in love. Fear of what? Fear of death. Fear of judgment. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. As is the head of the body, so is the body. As the Father loves the Son, so he loves us. So just these two verses, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen in us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Who did what, to whom, when, and why? God did it all. And this is the substance of the shadow that we studied on Wednesday night in Leviticus 14, the law of leprosy which is all about the redemption from death of the sinner by the work and the pronouncement of God. Verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Having predestinated, predetermined, ordained. Who? Us. Believers, saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus, unto the adoption of children. He's adopted us into his family. We're now a part of the family of God. Jesus said, or I should say in, in John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write that he, about Jesus, he was in the world and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, and to receive you have to 
choose to receive, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To receive is to believe. And those who do were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Born again of the Spirit of God when Jesus is received, when Jesus is believed. In the epistle to the Romans, we read in chapter 8, starting verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, a term of great endearment. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We were given the power to become the children of God. That power is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit testifies that we are the children of God. We've been adopted. How? By Christ. His person. His work. Not ours. In Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for both he that sanctifieth, the Lord Jesus, and they who are sanctified, believers in Lord Jesus, all are one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. The son of the father is not ashamed to call the adopted sons and daughters of God as his brother. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Himself whom? To the father. The father himself has adopted us as children by his son the father in heaven chose us to be his children according to in keeping with the good pleasure his delight his kindness of his will his choice his desire which begs the question what is god's will What is God's desire for Adam's race? Life. What happened in the garden? Death. Adam and Eve chose death because they did not believe, they did not obey God. They did not believe his testimony. Death entered into the creation. God, and so what did he do? He drove them out of the garden to keep them away from the tree of life, lest in their death they eat of eternal life and be eternally dead. He loved them, so he drove them away for their good. That's his will. That's his desire for Adam and Eve and all their descendants. Life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word. Oh, and and where did Jesus get his words? From the Father. He spoke the words of the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In the synagogue in Capernaum, the bread of life teaching in John chapter 6, starting verse 39, he said, Jesus said, This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and be raised, and I will raise him up at the last day. What's God's desire for me and for you? Life. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned because the wages of sin is death, death entered into 
perfect creation, if for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they which receive, receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What is God's will? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, speaking of God our Savior, who will, that's, that means his desire is, his, whose will to have all men be saved from death. He would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is long-suffering to us, word not willing that any should perish, that's the second death, but that all should come to repentance. The people of God in the Old Testament, Israel, we should learn from their history. It's checkered at best. In Ezekiel chapter 18, they're in captivity. Some of them are in captivity already. The prophet Ezekiel is in captivity, and he is prophesying to the Jews in captivity as well as the ones who are still in Jerusalem, who haven't, sin hasn't run its course there. In Ezekiel 18, starting verse 30, his exhortation to them is repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. What does Jesus want? What does the Father want? What does the Spirit want? Life. Moses, at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 30, he's not going into the promised land. He's giving these sermons to the children of the people who were led out of Egypt, but didn't believe that God would lead them into the promised land. And so they all wandered around until they died. Now the children are going to go in. And he's telling them in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verse 15, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. In verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. A choice was put before them. Only two. It's binary. Life or death. Well, let me think about that. Why do you have to think about that? Choose life. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, we read that, but is now made, Jesus is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, because in Jesus is life, and that life is the light of men. And we're now 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Someone was an ambassador of Christ to us with essentially the message, you have a choice, life or death. Choose life. And how many of us wrestled with that until we came into our right mind and, and chose life? But now we, in turn, are ambassadors to others who are choosing death. And our plea to them is, be ye reconciled to God. So what's the Bible say? The Bible says that God who chooses gives every person who's created in his image a choice to make. The sovereign God gives every person the sovereignty to choose. We are not robots. The Bible teaches God chooses. The Bible teaches man must choose. It's not a contradiction. The God who so loved us desires that we respond to his love by loving him. The relational God wants a relationship with us. 
and a relationship takes two willing volunteers. He is. The only question is, are we? And when we are, we're following Jesus. It's not a forced march. We have so chosen to follow Jesus. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Verses 3 through 5 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Why? I mean, after all, who are we? We're not righteous. There are none who are righteous. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Why? Verses 3 through, to the praise of the glory of his grace. The last verse of the last psalm, Psalm 100 verse, 150 verse 6 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Praise the Lord. Does it, is it circumstantially dependent? No. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Do you have breath? Praise the Lord. Let's read Psalm 98 together. Psalm 98. This is about the people of God, the children of God. Starting verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. He loves to hear us sing. Moms and dads, do you love to hear your kids sing? Does it matter if they can't carry a tune in their pocket? Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness has he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. Speaking of Jesus. He has remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. And let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity, with fairness. Isaiah 55 verse 12 tells us that we will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. In Ephesians chapter 1, he's done all this to the praise of the glory of his grace. All creation is going to praise the Lord. His most beloved, most of all. We praise God for his goodness that leads us to repentance. We give him all worship and praise and honor for his grace, whereby in his plan of redemption, he has saved sinners by paying for their sins so that he can forgive them without violating his justice or his character or his nature. And this, in this work, the Father has glorified the Son, the Son has glorified the Father, and the children of God glorify the Father and the Son. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made the maker, our creator, he's remade us who are saints, who are the faithful in Christ Jesus, we are not who we were. We're new creatures in Christ. He's made us accepted. He's made us righteous, pleasing, favorable in the beloved, in his family. 
so as with verses 3 and 4, so it is with verses 5 and 6, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Who has done what? To whom and why? God, who is rich in mercy. So these are the first two sentences of this letter. And there's a lot to chew on. You have to unpack it word at a time, certainly a phrase at a time, and chew on it, meditate on it. But before we go, we need to further meditate on two things. Verse 3, he has chosen us. And verse 5, he has predestinated us. What do those things mean? Well, is the world, is the church, is myself the filter through which I understand the Bible? Or is the Bible the filter through which I understand the world and the church and myself? The Bible is the filter. Do we interpret the word of God using the words of men or do we interpret the words of men using the word of God? Interpretation is not given to man. Believing is given to man. Scripture interprets scripture. So how did the almighty, the all-knowing, the all-seeing God who inhabits eternity and eternity is outside of time. Time is a, a dimension of his creation. How did he choose? How did he predestinate? On what basis did he choose? On what basis did he predestinate? Well, God chooses and he predestinates based on his foreknowledge. He knows all men's hearts. He knows everything. He knows all the choices of all the people. In Jeremiah 17, we're told God searches the hearts of men. In Revelation, 20, in Revelation 2, Jesus searches all the hearts. In Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit searches the hearts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit searches the hearts of all people. And he knows everything. Before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the universe and the creation of time, God foreknew the choices of all people. Starting with Adam and Eve, which means what? He knew what they were going to do. Right? And he foreknew the depth and the breadth of this problem, which is sin and death. Sin is the missing of the mark. Well, what's the mark? A perfection. Which is why the Father sent the Son. He promised the Son in Genesis chapter 3 and in the fullness of time he sent him. And then he returns to the right hand of the Father. Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit and the followers of Jesus Christ went out into the streets of Jerusalem and preached Jesus and him crucified and risen. And Peter said in the first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 23 of Jesus, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ a surprise to the Father? Forenoon, before Genesis 1-1. And we're told in Revelation 13-8 that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, before Genesis 1-1. In Romans 8, verses 29 and 30, we're told, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Predestinate is based on his foreknowledge. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that Jesus would be the firstborn of many. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them 
he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. God foreknew what we would do with his son. He foreknew if we would choose life or death. And for those who made the right choice, conformed, called, justified, glorified. In the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verse 2a, it says the elect, we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Before anything was, the Almighty, the all-knowing, the all-seeing God knew every person's choice. Life or death. That's the choice that's presented. Life or death. And he knows the choice. Life comes with believing. Death comes by not believing. And upon the knowledge of every person's choice, God chooses and predestinates. Therefore, I got to keep going. Uh, we have three doctrines of men that we have to discuss as it relates to this. First of all, there's a doctrine that every person is a child of God and everybody goes to heaven. It's even in the church. It's a doctrine of man. That's not what the Bible says. This letter is addressed to whom? The saints who are at Ephesus. Clearly, that's not everybody in the world, right? And it's also addressed to the faithful who are in Christ Jesus. Believers. Is everybody a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, no. The children of God are those who lean on Jesus to save them from the second death. They choose life. Those who do not choose life, those who do not lean on Jesus to save them from the second death, are the children of the devil. They're not the children of God. They're called children of disobedience and children of wrath because they've chosen death. So if, if, if you're here or you're there, or maybe you're there, and you haven't chosen life, chosen life, choose life. Today is a day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised. Secondly, this doctrine of men in the LGBTQ trans drag community that says, God made me this way. Well, if God chose people to be LGBTQ trans or drag, then what he says about sexual sin is not true. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Deuteronomy 22, Deuteronomy chapter 23, uh, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 3. If he chose people to be that way, then his word is not true and he is not to be trusted. To the LGBTQ trans drag, if any of you are listening now or, or later, uh, if God made you that way, well then God made you a sinner and chose you to be separated from him and judged and condemned by him. And that is not a loving God. If what God has said is true about sexual sin, and then he chose people to be LGBTQ trans drag, then God is malicious and capricious. He's not who he says he is. He's a liar. But God cannot lie. He does not contradict himself. His word is true. He is trustworthy. He's not malicious. He's not capricious. So God did not make you that way. You've made a choice to behave that way. And it's a choice and a behavior that God calls sin. 
a sin that's to be repented of, a sin that the Father sent his Son to suffer and die for because he so loves sinners. Saying that God made me this way, if you believe that, you've believed a lie from hell and you've received a deception in order to justify your behavior before man and God. And God ain't buying it. He never buys any lies. By his word, God speaks against the behavior of LGBTQ, trans, drag, because it's harmful to people he loves. And he tells us that in his word to correct and to instruct in righteousness. And so if you are a part of that community, God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus bore your sin and died a horrible, horrible death for your sins. And you are a sinner just like every other person. And God is displeased and dishonored by your sin just as he is with the liar and the thief and the adulterer. And he's calling you. He's inviting you to come to him to repent of your sin just as he calls liars and thieves and adulterers. Your chosen behavior is self-destructive, as is the behavior of a liar, a thief, and an adulterer. He has so much better for you. It's called life <laughs> and hope and peace and joy. He's got a gift for you that he's paid for. So call on his name and receive it. Before it's too late. The third doctrine of men that we have to discuss is Calvinism. The doctrine of predestination didn't start with John Calvin. It started with Augustine in 412. He believed and he taught that God elected some and destined them for salvation. But he elected others and destined them for eternal condemnation. That God unilaterally predetermined who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Later in the 16th century during the Reformation, a rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church, John Calvin believed and taught what's become known as Calvinism or Reformed Theology, which is crystallized in a, an acronym called TULIP. T standing for total depravity. U for unconditional election. L for limited atonement, I for irresistible grace, and P for the perseverance of Satan. At the heart of Reformed theology, at the heart of Calvinism, is this concept of predestination. And Calvinists believe that at the beginning of time, God unilaterally selected a limited number of people to salvation, and there isn't anything they can do to change it. And he also selected the rest of mankind to condemnation. And there isn't anything they can do about that. And they believe that Jesus died only for the elect. Well, if Calvinism is true, then God's a liar. Because God so loved the... that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe... In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus is the propitiation of our sins and not of us only, but of the whole world. If Calvinism is true, then looking at Ephesians chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 5, if Calvinism is true, then the pleasure of his will is life for a few and death for most. That's not good. That's not loving. That's wicked evil, and corrupt. Let's look at a couple verses. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Putting before the people a choice. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few be there 
and few there be that find it. And then in 1 John, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, starting verse 10, well, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar, because he believeth not the record, the testimony that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son has not life. If what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, if what Paul was inspired to write here, if Calvinism is true, these are malicious taunts by a cruel God who is not what he says he is. And if Calvinism is true, then there's no rhyme or reason to salvation. Salvation is purely subjective, and our behavior, our choices have no bearing whatsoever on it. Does that sound like something that would come from the God of order or from the author of confusion? See, Calvinism uses the doctrines of men to interpret the word of God. And in so doing, they corrupt the truth. The word of God must be used to interpret the words of men. And by the word of God, Calvinism is deficient. The Bible teaches God chooses. The Bible teaches men must choose. It's not a contradiction. All because of the foreknowledge of the all-knowing God. You might say, well, I choose Jesus. I choose life. Well, God knew you would. And he, when you did, he made you a new creature in Christ. Well, you know, I don't choose Jesus. I choose death. Well, God knew you would. And he contends with you. That's the wrong choice. He contends with you to make the right choice because he loves you. But if you insist on that, he'll let you have it. So, what is God's will? Life choose life if there's anyone here or out there or listening later uh, and you haven't yet cho chosen life choose it right now today is the day of salvation amen if you'd stand with me please